My name's Len Thomas and I'm a statistical ecologist at the University of St Andrews. So a statistical ecologist is somebody who uses statistics to understand uh, ecological problems. The cotton top tamarind story begins back in 2002 when we were teaching some training workshops to biologists um, about different methods of estimating animal population size. And one of the people there was Dr Anne Savage. She's a conservation biologist and she works um, at Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park in Orlando, Florida. And one of the things she wanted to find out about was how to estimate the population size of a small endangered monkey in Colombia called the cotton top tamarind. Cotton tops are found in the wild only in the northwest of Colombia in the forests there. And they're classed as critically endangered. The main threats to them are habitat destruction because their forests are being cut down to make way for cattle pasture and also um, the trees are used for house building and firewood. And they're also captured um, for an illegal pet trade. The reason that they're so hard to count is that they're tiny, they're only about 20 centimetres long or so. They live 20 metres up in the forest canopy and if people come anywhere near them they run away without being seen quite silently. This means that none of the standard survey methods that we use are going to work. Um, for example, these involve um, setting out a series of random survey strips and counting the animals on those strips, but that's clearly not going to work for cotton tops because you won't count any. Um, another idea that people often use is that they take a sample of po a population and they uh, mark it, they put a mark on it, and then they visit a second time and see what proportion of animals that were originally marked they see again. Um, that isn't going to work for cotton tops because you can trap them once but they won't go near a trap again. Um, another thing people use is um, DNA marking or some kind of a natural marking. For example, with tigers they have, they have natural markings, but cotton tops aren't marked um, naturally in that way and uh, their DNA just isn't worked out, so that's not going to work either. One thing that Anne told us that did give us some hope, however, was that they respond to playback. So if you play back the sound of a lost monkey, because they're territorial, they run straight in to find out who that is. And if it's realistic enough, they get close enough that you can count how many of them there are. Of course, it only works once or twice because after that they cotton on to the fact that it's a human. This started a really interesting process for us where we would um, give Anne ideas that, for new ways that we thought of that you could count this population and her and her field team would go out and try them and then they'd come back and tell us that they didn't work. At this point, Anne suggested that it would be much better if one of us went down to Colombia um, so that we could try out our stupid ideas and then when they didn't work, come up with another one straight away. So that's what we did. It was May 2005 when I went down there armed with uh, our latest and greatest idea and, and this was the idea. So we'd have two field teams going on, along at the same time in parallel and they'd be close enough together that all the monkeys within the strip formed by those two teams as they walked along would respond. And as we moved along, animals that came in and responded, we could use the direction that they came in to tell us whether they were inside the strip or outside the strip. And if they were inside, we'd count them in our estimate. So we flew into the beautiful city of Cartagena and we went straight the next morning to Ansfield site and set to work testing this idea out. I actually hadn't realized until then how big the boom box that you have to carry to fool these monkeys is. It's absolutely enormous and it takes one person just to carry the thing. Actually, the field team is, is four people on each side of these lines, so there's eight in total. You've got a guy at the front who's slashing his way through the forest with a machete, and then behind that is somebody who's uh, taking notes and keeping everybody oriented and so on, keeping the two people, two teams in parallel. And then behind that, there's the guy with the boom box who's slugging away with this heavy thing. And then right at the end, there's the person who's actually looking for the monkeys. Initially, we weren't even sure if it was going to be possible to have two field teams moving in parallel through this thick forest when they can't even see each other. But the field team did a really, really excellent job of that, um, using a GPS and, and other devices to keep themselves parallel um, and uh, not too far in front of each other. And we set up our first trial um, some distance away from a group where we thought we knew where they'd be um, because they see them quite regularly on their study site. And we were only moving through the forest for maybe 20 minutes or so when bang, they came in right in the middle of our transect. And that was an enormous success for us and we were, we were really, really pleased at that point. And over the next uh, two days, we did about five or six trials. And each time we had exactly the same result. They always came in bang where we thought they were. So this is a picture of us looking really, really pleased at the end of our two days of field trials. We actually had a method that we thought would work, finally. So the next step was to take what we'd learned on the field trials and roll it out to a whole population census. And to do this, we took some satellite imagery that uh, people at uh, Disney's Animal Kingdom had previously analysed in 1990, where they'd taken satellite maps of the area and worked out what could possibly be forest. We couldn't visit all of those areas, though, because there are some parts of Colombia that are quite unstable politically and, and really not safe for field crews to visit. So the parts that we could visit over the next few months, the field teams went there and they worked out what part of that was actually cotton top habitat, so somewhere, some forest that the animals could live in. 
And we were enormously shocked by the result because of the 4,000 kilometers squared or so that we'd identified, only about 99 kilometers squared was actually cotton top habitat, so about 2.5%. The rest of it had either been logged in the interim or was misidentified in the forest images. So in these remaining patches, we laid out a systematic grid of these uh, transects like I talked about before, in the patch itself and also in a buffer area around the patch because it's known that sometimes the monkeys can go outside um, to forage or something like that. And then over the few months after that, the field team visited all 300 or so of these transects doing that survey along each one of them. It was an enormous uh, effort for them, but they did a really fantastic job of it. And some of the things they found were actually quite shocking. So there was one patch that they went to um, where it had been recently cut down and there was one tree left and all the monkeys they saw on that transect were sheltering in this one tree. So in the end they saw about 100 monkeys inside the surveyed strips and once we crunch the numbers that translates into an estimate of 2,050 monkeys in the area that they could safely survey. So then we had to assume that the density of animals in the area they surveyed was the same as the area that they didn't and when we do that that works out to a total population estimate in the wild of around 7,400 monkeys left. That was in 2007 when they did the survey. There's probably considerably fewer of them there now. Because of our study, the cotton top tamarind's been placed on the IUCN's list of the 25 most endangered primates in the world. And conservation effort now is being focused on the areas that we've identified, the patches that contain the largest uh, fragments of population that are left. Um, hopefully these can be expanded in future. And our survey provides a nice baseline for the numbers that are there. We're planning another uh, survey in one or two more years time. And now that we've had some success with cotton top tamarinds, Anne Savage at Disney's been asking me what we can now do about estimating numbers of sea turtles around the world, for which we currently don't have estimates. So we'll see what happens there. <laughs>